the flow of invisible cultural matrices. The three major themes in these kings, oral communication, literature, and interactive networks, can be highlighted through the following structuring questions, what we still have inherited from our past, how it got its start, how it humanizes us to this day, how it works on the principle of balance between opposites, what other problems it causes, what hope it gives for our future. These questions are meaningful for a number of reasons. First, it is hardly a coincidence exactly what we have inherited from our past, so that we preserve it in the layers of our cultivation to this day. Why, for example, have we kept fire burning even though hydropower, hydroelectric plants, and solar panels already exist? Why have we kept the bow even though firearms already exist? Why we have kept the hoe, spade, and spade? Even though excavators already exist, or else why have we kept the house even though we could live in a block of flats or in a caravan? And perhaps even more important is why we still need stories, songs, theater, why beliefs, including religions, superstitions, and belief in magic, do not die out, despite the omnipresence of modern technocratic rational science. Or else why do we still need moral feelings like hope, love and honor when it is easier to live callously and amorally? Why do we need to preserve and transmit the nostalgia for the memory of the past and the dream of the ideal, the same as we find in the books of Hesiod, Plato, John Exarch Bulgarian, E. T. A. Hoffman, Lao Tzu or Al-Ghazali? Why did Cervantes and Kant, Shakespeare and Mozart, Tolstoy and Chaplin, Curosa and the Beatles stay on the floor of our civilizational cultures, and not some other artist or other creative group, why them? Why have the words quixoticism, paganism, sadism or surrealism become household names, archetypal? Why not such words as, for example, Dionism, Insaravism, Martabiliakinism, Fictism or Post-Impressionism? Probably the answer to these questions is much more multi-layered than we could gather in hundreds of pages or even in several volumes of books. Perhaps one of the keys to it is that culture, like any system, develops through trial and error. Among the millions and billions of wrong solutions to a collective psychic socio-cultural problem, there is also one that remains in the future because it is, at best, something essentially important, which cannot be expressed better, more Jung's words. And it is precisely this thing that we have inherited from our ancestors, combined with the covenant to relay it to our descendants, so that it will remain inside the house of our cultivation in the future, because in some way, often a mysterious and incomprehensible way, it is alive important to our humanity. And if we guess or see, at least partially, how exactly it proved to be vitally important for the generations before us, there is a chance to touch the great mystery of Eki Homo, what is man, is this man, why this is man, what he is, what he can and what he is about to become, what is universally human, what is the humanizing and humanizing quality, or qualities, including as a project for our future. Second, in order to understand what a cultural, psychically cultivated or inherited communal or social superiority, for example, theatrical art, logical thinking or parliamentarism really is, we often need to go back to its roots, to its origin. Keys to answers to the question of why a particular hyperreality has been passed down through the generations to survive to this day, may also be the reasons why it came into being. We must also bear in mind that, despite its quantum nature simultaneously existing and not existing, cultural hyperreality is an extremely conservative organism. Usually, as a cultural phenomenon began, so it continues into the future. In part, this is due to the fact that mental innovations are exemplary in nature. For example, the first ingenious works of fiction in Europe, Iliad and Odyssey, by Homer, also became a benchmark for European fiction. Every writer who succeeded them copied and repeated the motifs and ideas in them to this day, whether they realized it or not, including the good modern novelists. In the same way, the first genius high art film, Chaplin's The Kid, became the model for all cinematography that followed it. There is hardly a motif or concept in art cinema whose prototype cannot be found in The Kid. In this sense, if we want to understand the surreality of European fiction, it makes sense to understand its prototype, Homer, and if we want to understand the phenomenon of cinema art, it would be good to turn to its primary model, Chaplin's films. By the same logic, to better understand what ideals, and the ideal, are, the most appropriate reading for the occasion remains, until now, the tale of the shadows and the cave from Plato's Republic, the work, 
in in which these terms and notions were first introduced and explained by examples, by reasoning and by metaphors. Fabulous allegories captivating the senses and the mind, for which it was not by chance that Albert Whitehead claimed that, the whole of European philosophy is a footnote. To Plato. In an analogous way, if we want to understand more about the Republic as a socio-political civilizational superreality, it is good to look at its prototype, the Roman Republic. The original model of this administrative system with all its subsystems, citizenship, civil rights, legal state, representativeness, forum, senate, electability, mandate, clientelism, rhetoric, deliberations, consensus, types of voting in making common decisions, emancipation and struggles for emancipation, and also a republican ideal worth sacrificing for. The exemplary nature of the socio-cultural phenomena passed down through the generations also predetermines their course of development, including by virtue of a phenomenon that we can figuratively call the law of the course, universal for the evolution of any system in principle, or, as the popular saying goes, where it has flowed, it will flow again. In this perspective, the knowledge of the beginnings patterns of the psychic mental socio-cultural superphenomena gives us light and for a clearer awareness of the truly revolutionary changes in them. Because every single revolutionary change is actually a deviation from the channel and a change in the channel of the general flow of development by upgrading to a new branch, known in the scientific language under the term, bifurcation, with a new quality. It is easy to determine how a new quality in a mutation or bifurcation has turned out to be technologically revolutionary. It is evident that wheeled carts are considerably more convenient for the carriage of burdens on overland roads than the sleigh bogey, that earthenware vessels are more versatile than wicker baskets because liquids can also be stored and boiled in them, that the phonetic system of the Phoenician script is better, more accurate and easier to remember and understand than the syllabic or the ideograms that the production of paper was much more efficient than the processing of parchment, that typing with word processors on a laptop is far less labor-intensive than typing on a typewriter. It is much more difficult to determine how a given cultural change proved to be revolutionary from the point of view of the humanization of man, from the point of view of realizing humanity as a project for the future. But it is precisely the quiet and invisible revolutions of man-making that turn out to be the essential watersheds that make possible the psychomental, social, political, economic and technological innovations in our anthroposphere. Thus, for example, the ability to communicate in words is the basis of the ability to think logically, and of course it is also the basis of analysis and invention, of songs, tales and arts, of writing literature, of printing books and of internet communication. In this regard, it is more than clear why the speaking of the protoman was humanizing and humanizing. It becomes more complicated, however, if we want to answer the questions why music, folk dances, religions, mass ideologies or irony, nostalgia and longing for the unattainable are humanizing. The complexity comes from the hyperreal quantum nature of these phenomena. But without making an attempt to unravel this complexity, with intuition, with reason, and with value moral feelings, we will hardly be able to answer any question of our survival related to the future of the human superworld. The path to unraveling the complexity of the human goes through the insight into the original paradoxical character of every system in principle. Although they are far more complex than any other existing systematics, invisible cultural systems also operate by attempting a zeroing balance between at least two polar opposites, which in linguistic theory we define as antonyms and in literary studies as antagonists. Anyone can name the antagonists in the plot of a fairy tale, myth, epic, or novel, for example, the Lama versus the hero, the Montagues and Capulets versus Romeo and Juliet, Suleimans, Hordes versus Shipka's militia. Harry Potter's Companions vs. the Evil Lord Voldemort's Death Eaters, Jesus Christ vs. Satan, as well as an infinite number of antonyms in language, mind vs. stupidity, civilization vs. barbarism, love vs. hate, kindness vs. malice. The important quality in the systematicity of cultures, however, is not the obvious oppositions that destroy them, but the magical qualities of balance between them that paradoxically unite them, combine them in equilibrium so that they have a chance to survive and develop, to have a future at all.
In this regard, in Romeo and Juliet, the wet nurse and the priest are unexpectedly essential. In the tale of the golden apple, the grandmother, or the bird, who tells the hero how to defeat the llama, and in the world of antonyms dichotomies, forgiveness, which balances love and hatred, the retribution and redemption and moral transformation that reconcile goodness and malice. The connecting link between the barbarian and the civilized is perhaps honor, which makes dialogue between them possible, and somewhere between stupidity and reason stands the saving quality of modesty for both extremes. Similarly, the imbalances of overclosedness and overopenness of social networks are overcome by the selective semi-openness and semi-permeability of interpersonal groups based on shared causes and values. The balancing qualities, equators, between the mutually annihilating poles do not allow them to annihilate each other, but also never manage to reconcile or balance them completely. The processes of their unobtrusive development towards more and more complicated structures are due to this. But the balances and our humanization do not only give rise to solutions to socio-cultural, community mental and spiritual problems. They also give rise to new problems that have yet to be solved some of which seem even more threatening to our future than they were before the emergence of innovative expressions of humanity, and effective solutions to old conflicts. It would be very naive if we consider the achieved balances or revolutionary changes in human creation to be panaceas that effortlessly, and inevitably lead us to spiritual and cultural progress, to infinity and ever further and upwards. Often the reasons for our dehumanization are due to our humanization, and vice versa and the causes of the intractable problems of our survival are due to their solutions, and vice versa. In this sense, we need to understand what problems the solutions related to our humanity create, as well as what chances and hopes for our development and survival as human beings in our future they provide us. The focus in considering these problems can be directed to several non-obvious socio-cultural superrealities of a revolutionary human-creating character, the upbringing of intelligent animals, the complex thinking of ancient women, archetypes and living symbols in individual and collective mental life, the paradoxical structure of morality, the oral coding of knowledge in syntheses, collective empathy and catharsis in the prototheater of tribal rituals, the art of communicating with moral feelings, syncretism in folklore, justice in unseen fantastic beliefs. The poeticization of the world by ancient wandering poets, myths as tales of retribution and redemption, religions as a moral appreciation of the cosmos, conceptual thinking as a reason for individualism, ideals as a crucifixion between nostalgia and a dream, sacred books as civilizational value models, the connection of nation-states with mass ideologies and with printing. Some of the considered invisible phenomena of the psyche, mentality, spirit and societies themselves have the character of cultural and or civilizational living symbols with human-changing revolutionary dimensions when communicating in context. Such key symbols for our superworld are, for example, the ship, the wall, the book, the invisible motherland, the novels of life, the cinematography, the global village, and the home planet. They should also be seen as symbols of the change in the cultural context of communication if we are to delve deeper into the history of the unseen, into the strange nature of our human project of an overworld. In tracing the structuring questions presented in considering the history of revolutionary changes in communication with a cultural context, the conclusions could be tentatively presented in the following type of scheme for the humanization of man through the generation of communal psychic cultivated superrealities, for example, upbringing, verbal language, complex thinking, morality. Like any scheme, this one is too sketchy. In so far as it is necessary for the limitation and structuring of the purposes, analysis, conjectures, hypotheses, and conclusions in the historical examination of changes in the communication and contextual manifestations of the unseen in the human soul and spiritual superreal superworld, it will be better to follow as a compass orientation for thought, but without falling into literalism. The transdisciplinary complex analysis of the invisible cultural heritage of humans, therefore, can also be seen as an antidote to the intense processes of dehumanization caused by civilizational development. Perhaps the degradation of the human in us today is no more massive than it was in our historical past. And it is possible that a century or millennia ago people were brutalized and mentally unhealthy to a much greater extent than they are in today's age, as Maslow claims. But the stiff Roman plebs, 
the beggars of the Chinese celestial empire, or the ragged half-men half-beasts of the European Middle Ages, so well described by Jacques Le Goff, or the lumpen proletariat of Marx's time, though they presented a sad and pathetic picture and caused many cruelties in the recent past, have never until now become a threat to the survival of the human species, to the living world on Earth, and perhaps even to the existence of our planet. However, it is completely true that in the current century it is precisely mass dehumanization that is seen as a fatal threat to both humanity and the human life support system of the global biosphere. The possibility of literally destroying ourselves, along with the global climate balance and the planetary ecosystems, due to simple stupidity and indolence, from simplification, from soullessness and spiritlessness, or from amoralism, suggests the answer to the question, why the invisible cultural heritage of excess, the real is saving and who and what does it save? The salvation of spirits and souls in and through him is no longer an abstraction, not even a living symbol, as it was presented for centuries by Christian teaching in the past, but has also acquired a literal meaning, in a pure form. Because soullessness and spiritlessness today are transformed technologically, not only into a metaphysical, but also into a very physical, bodily threat to the human species.